Hello, and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And uh, we have an interesting guest going to be talking tonight about an incredible sighting that he and his family had out on the West Coast in uh, Washington State on Bainbridge Island. That happened back in July 5th, 2019. And we'll be talking all about that and some other things. We're going to be moving along as we go. I did want to talk about the um, the thing that's in the news right now is the blue uh, UFO over Hawaii. A lot of people have been contacting me. Um, a lot of friends that actually know that I uh, I am involved in the UFO field have been contacting me that do not normally, um, you know, uh, question UFOs or even pay attention to them. But anyway, I'm going to show this clip. This is um, uh, ABC 7 News out of uh, Hawaii. It's a real quick quick clip, uh, I think like a minute long or something like that. So it'll give you an idea what we're talking about with this blue uh, UFO. And uh, if you're listening to just the audio, unfortunately, um, all you have to do is, uh, well, actually, I'll put, a, I'll put a link in the show notes. How's that? So you can actually watch the video. Here it goes. Officials from the Federal Aviation Administration say there were no aircraft incidents or accidents in this area Tuesday night, but multiple witnesses report seeing a large blue object fall out of the sky and into the ocean. Something is in the sky. What is that? This video was taken by Misitina Sape at 826 Tuesday night near Haleakala Avenue in Nanakuli. Not long after, a woman named Mariah spotted the same thing passing over Princess Kahanu Estates. I don't know, I looked up, and then I was like, oh, it was all in the garage. I was like, hey, come look up there. She doesn't see what I see. They all said, yeah. The 38-year-old says she's never really been a believer in UFOs, but the bright blue objects had them so intrigued, they jumped in the car and started following it. Okay, this is what... Um, now, uh, I, I saw a tweet from Alejandro Rojas, my friend, um, on um, kind of a theory. It's a working theory. Uh, of course, this thing did end up in the drink. It actually went into the water. And if you were hang gliding, um, you wouldn't really want to land in the middle of the ocean, I wouldn't think. But anyway, that's uh, the, you see this picture again. I'll put this in the show notes as well. It could be what we're looking at in that video, whatever. And uh, that has gone totally viral um, around the world. So um, again, it could be the answer. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, but there you go. That is uh, that is a, a working theory at this point. It's always good to get an answer if possible on what a UFO is because it's, as it's been said many times, it only takes one real one to, uh, you know, that can be proven um, wherever it's from. Uh, anyway, it just takes one. And uh, there, as uh, a lot of people know that pay attention to this topic, there's something like at least 10% that are unexplained, which uh, is fascinating. And uh, and the reason that the movie title of what uh, James Fox did, um, the phenomenon, that movie was originally titled 701, which was the 701 uh, UFO sightings that could not be explained um, in Project Blue Book during their tenure. So I want to say happy, uh, happy uh, 2021, everyone. We made it. Uh, we actually made it. So uh, hang in there. Hope everyone stays safe. And as we continue on, uh, I do think things will, will uh, get better as we go along here. Now, um, if you head on over to Podcast UFO, our weekly blog this week is Injured by the UFO Part 2, and that has a story about the Falcon Lake incident and uh, several others that are really interesting. One of that I've never heard of, a woman, you know, driving in a car and uh, a beam coming down and, and like burning her arm or something really strange. So uh, uh, there are some of those cases. And if you support the show, I want to thank you very much. And uh, if you can't support the show and you're just a regular listener, I still want to thank you too. And uh, if you would like to support us for $2 or more a month, you can go over at patreon.com slash Martin Willis Podcast UFO. Uh, next week, I am announcing we have, uh, I'm hoping, uh, hoping I can say his name correctly, Nabosa Borkovich. Um, he will be talking about a encounter out at sea, another fascinating uh, show that should be. And uh, 
there's a heck of a lot to that one, but there's also a heck of a lot to the one we're going to be talking about tonight. And my guest, uh, Tim Senor, welcome to the show. Happy New Year, Martin. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for uh, being willing to come on. And uh, you you had quite a sighting. But before we get into that, just a quick uh, a quick background about yourself. You have sure. a background in psychology and a writer. Why don't you just fill in the blanks a little bit? Absolutely. So um, I was actually born David Powers in 1970 in upstate New York in Rochester. And so um, I do use David Powers quite often. And in other interviews, I've used David Powers just to kind of clarify so that people understand I'm Tim Senor and I'm David Powers. So don't be confused if you see something done by me. Um, and then um, my parents adopted me um, and my father worked for Xerox. Um, so being in Rochester, New York in the 70s or 80s, you are definitely going to be either working for Kodak or Xerox. And so my dad worked for Xerox and my mother, um, so he had his PhD in chemistry and worked for Xerox in polymer technology, which is an advanced science in rubber science and static conductivity. My mother, um, she has her master's degree in natural science and she taught uh, in numerous schools, uh, taught science and education. So um, my education came in, uh, my background is in psychology, and then I went on to get an undergraduate degree in uh, writing and producing. So uh, that is what I do now. I write and produce, and um, also being a, a COVID person, uh, working from home and raising five kids all at the wow. same time. So I know how noisy that can be. <laughs> yeah, Zoom meetings for school, oh, Zoom boy. meetings for me, a lot of online business being done nowadays. So uh, fast forward, uh, my parents moved from upstate New York, Rochester to uh, Bainbridge Island. Uh, Washington, which is directly across the Puget Sound from Seattle. And so uh, they moved there. My sister, uh, a couple of years older than me, joined the Army and became a general's aide, uh, moved up quite quickly in the ranks. She's also um, got her master's degree in science and health. Uh, so Moving on a little bit forward to, uh, uh, so this day in particular, and I'm not sure if you're ready to move into the sighting. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's let's go right into it. It was, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> so We're um, ready here. <laughs> right. Um, so July 5th was, uh, 2019 was a day that we all decided to be together. And so... Uh, we had a large breakfast and all of the adults with the exception of my oldest son and my wife decided and myself decided to go down to a beach on Bainbridge Island called Rockaway Beach. And on this particular day, um, it was special because the tides were the lowest that they would be all year. And so you can see, um, Bainbridge Island there, and I have put a little black dot kind of where Rockaway Beach is. Um, and so they had all gone down to the beach ahead of time, and the three of us had stayed back to get the house kind of ready for lunch and for early dinner. We usually eat like around three. Uh, so uh, nearing two o'clock, I decided that I would drive down since um, the whole family was down there. I decided I would go down and join them, uh, at which point I parked in a little parking area there and ventured down towards the beach along a little path. Uh, so I'll just kind of set up the scenario. Um, my parents are seated to my right up on 
the top of the beach kind of on a bench and looking out towards Seattle, Western Seattle, across the Puget Sound. Uh, so I was walking towards them and looking slightly left towards the water, my family, um, which was consisting at that time of, let's see, it was my sister and her husband, my second oldest son and my two youngest, and my sister's oldest and two younger daughters. So quite a group of people all venturing up towards me on the beach. Um, I'm walking towards my mom and she stands up, kind of peering off in the distance and points up kind of over my shoulder uh, towards central Seattle, kind of in the air and says, did you hear that? And I said, no, uh, what are you looking at or something to that extent and kind of was focused on my two little children that were trying to kind of venture their way up the beach. It's rocky beach. So they were all really having to look down quite a lot uh, walking up that rocky beach. Anyway, so I, my concern was with them and, and kind of how they were doing um, getting up the beach. So as I'm doing that, I kind of look up towards my mom had pointed. And at the time that I took that look up, uh, my sister's oldest pointed in that direction and said, oh, look, a saucer. And kind of like had this look on his face and I, cause I was looking at him. I was like, what is he talking about a saucer? And I looked up and there did look like there was just something sitting in the sky, um, a, a disc shape and gray. Um, I was like, that's, that's odd. And I suddenly realized I'd love to take a picture of this, but I don't have my phone. So I ran uh, back up to the parking lot where my truck was parked and grabbed my cell phone and booked back down there. Um, my mom was still standing and looking in that direction. At this point, some of my family, I think, was looking up there, if not all of them at that point. Um, the object was still in the same location, so I lifted my phone and fired off a photograph. Um, I decided to go at the time with HD photos because I knew that my iPhone 10 performed a little bit better with HD photos than with video um, if I was going to potentially take a look at this later. So um, I was excited because I didn't know what I was looking at, um, although at the same rate, I did think potentially it was just jets or maybe like some kind of jet that can hover and also break the sound barrier since my mom had noticed a sound um, that I had not noticed, uh, by the way. But were, um, pardon me, what, did you, um, you said this, were you right there, but you just didn't happen to notice a sound or did it right happen there, earlier? I was right there, but did not notice a sound at that time. Huh. Um, because she brought that sound to my attention initially. Um, there's, you know, there's ocean noise, there's yeah. family noise, and my attention was definitely not in the sky. Yeah. At the time coming down, I was totally on my four and three-year-old children. Um, so, yeah, I, I hadn't noticed that initial sound that my mother had noticed. Mm -hmm. um, so, Moving on with that, from there, I had taken that first photograph, which um, clearly shows what we were looking at. Um, Is this one of the ones that you sent me? I did. I sent you all the photos, but in particular, the last two have close-ups. And so I, I- Is this it right here? Nope, the one before that. Okay. Yep. All That's right. So again, we'll, we will put these in the show notes for those of you who are listening to audio. You can check that out. Um, so what are we looking at right there? What do you think we're looking at? A zoomed, uh, or rather, you know, zoomed and then cropped with my iPhone is what that photo is. So I yeah. zoom it in and crop it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so 
in my opinion, that that does it pretty well justice. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to take a picture of a of an airplane, but it's pretty tough. Um, yeah. It, and so my photos don't really do my story as much justice, but they're still great photos considering what took place. And as we move forward, I'll give you guys as much detail as I can. And I will be completely open with you guys on anything, any questions, any details I can add. I would love to because it's a, it's a pretty big deal. It changed all of our lives. Anyways, let's move on because this story gets better. Um, as I was watching, it just kind of seemed to disappear and then immediately reappear very close by. Um, so disappear, reappear. And at that time, I noticed about 100 meters maybe below a spark, just a little spark, at which point I was taking more photos. Um, so that correlates with the second photo that you have. But the, the photos you have are all the originals as well. So those are wide shots. Mm -hmm. And so you can make them available to whoever would like them. Like this right here. Yeah, that's going to be further on. We're not there yet. The very top of the line uh, is going to be some of the earlier photos. But anyways, we'll get to that. Um, so that little spark ended up being important to the story. Um, uh, anyway, so I fired off that second photograph. And as I'm firing off that second photograph, my dad, over my right shoulder, who is still seated, says, well, what's that down there? And he was pointing further down Seattle, almost to the western point of Seattle, um, at which point I kind of just dragged my camera across and started firing photos in the direction my dad was pointing, at which point I could clearly make out a series of objects kind of moving. And so the important thing to take away from this was how these things were moving. Um, they would seem to shudder or like pop across. Um, it's, it's really hard to explain how they were coordinating. Anyways, at that point, um, what my father had noticed was a bright light. And that bright light, as I was looking at it, kind of opened up into a perfect square in the sky. And just above that little square in the sky, there was a little thread of light attached to it in the corner. And at the end of that thread of light was a little cigar shaped object uh, or Tic Tac shaped object. So I'm taking a photograph and trying to look at what I'm seeing. And I'm like, oh, this has to be a helicopter. This has to be um, an airplane pulling a sign. This has to be some kind of reflection. Um, it was so odd to see um, because as you're as I was looking at this square, it appeared to almost be three dimensional box, not really a square, but a, a box. Um, and at which point the saucer disappeared and then reappeared um, perhaps on the other side of the box. And so I couldn't tell if something was coming in or out of that square. Um, and there, there were other details that I did see. It's just hard to put them into words. Um, but moving on with the sighting, um, I, we can always go back. So I'll just get through it initially, and then we can sure. rewind. Yep. Um, and so that was daunting. I didn't know what I was looking at. So I just continued to take photos. At the next photo that uh, I shared with you shows what happened next. And it's, I, I understand your viewers are going to really look at me in, in a way thinking that I'm nuts. Because to see something like this and photograph it, 
you're like, okay, this guy's photographing military stuff or something uh, normal, but this was odd. So the square seemed to recoil kind of slowly, um, like, like if you were reeling a net in. Hmm. But it was so bright. It was as bright as the sun. And in fact, my, my camera had a hard time interpreting that light. Um, and it was very, it was incredible to watch because it looked like a star closing, like a star going away. And I was like, okay, this could be like a plane turning at me. Am I seeing headlights? I was running through the whole gamut. But what clearly happened was it appeared that that square retracted back up into that little cigar shaped tic tac object and then in my subsequent photos they continued west um in in a group um in the same fashion that they had and, and what and at, at this point are they not like popping in and out of existence. They're just on a steady, steady no, no, stream. They're still moving the same way, like shuddering. Um, like the little white speck that I had seen initially as a flash was darting around and seemed to like be on top and then below and then um, moving in very odd, like, like a fly or a bee around a flower. Hmm. Except this was way up in the sky and indescribable. If I hadn't had the photos, I would have just crossed it off. If I didn't see it firsthand, I wouldn't believe it's potentially real. And, you know, Martin, I, and I've said this before, um, even witnessing it, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. My mom has an incredible recollection, but for some reason, she has a hard time with some of those details. Um, this was not something that anyone in my family had ever thought about before other than entertainment. Um, and so it was a new understanding, a, a new way of thinking. So I was fresh on it. I, I was and I'm not doing the story justice and I would love to go back and tell it again for you because there are so many little details that I know I saw that I'm not really recalling perfectly for you right now. However, um, the big takeaway was that this was a Tic Tac coordinating with objects and potentially we're looking at what that technology does. This is just a, a little comment here um, for someone that wants you to feel more comfortable. Uh, you're not nuts, Tim. You're amongst your fellow UFO community. I don't mm -hmm. hear Martin Willis playing the X-Files theme song to ridicule right. you like the news does. <laughs> I thought it was the pretty funny. A pretty good with, comment. Thank yeah, you, the Renee. problem isn't with you, Renee, or any of your listeners, Martin. It's with the science community that doesn't take this seriously or – potentially people I work with, because before, I mean, this day, um, you know, I had never planned on coming out with something like this. This isn't something I'm comfortable talking about. It's not something I even really believe, but you know what? Yeah. yeah. It, it's starting to look undeniable, especially witnessing it. I mean, Witnessing it was incredible. To see something move like that across the sky is indescribable. When you know with your family you witness something move um, a, a very large distance in no time at all. Now, performing yeah. incredible feats. It now, was, you mentioned your, your father has a PhD in chemistry. Um, so does my uh, brother-in-law who may actually be listening right now out in the Washington. He's actually in Washington. I don't know what it's all about. Um, but, but, but let um, me just ask you this. Yeah. Did, did uh, someone with a science background like your dad, what was he, what was his conjecture of what he was seeing? Right. So we got back to the house and started putting some numbers down and we looked at the map, figured out about how far it was about how high it was, 
figuring out some dis some distances and speeds and ridiculous to say out loud ridiculous to say out loud speeds and my father's interpretation was that it was incredible um but at the same rate he felt strongly that it was something that could potentially be ours and this is where the story moves to its next phase of incredible because we witnessed it and did a lot of thinking and decided if it is something military, that's great. We have something that is incredible. Let's not talk about it. Let's report it to the right agency, let them determine what it is. And that's exactly what I did. I immediately reported to MUFON and they responded back. And um, I gave details. Um, they took time to research it. Um, they have an interesting way of doing business, and that is that they need to close cases. Um, the way you move up in ranks and move on is by closing cases. Mm. They're out to close cases. And they weren't able to close my case. My case is still open, which is great because they determined, of course, my photos aren't tampered with. The evidence is real, and it's within the 5% of cases that they can't close, and it's considered a UAP. Wow, and so I didn't realize that was the number, 5%. 5%. And that, so um, initially, I, I was frustrated by that because I was like, well, you've given me great information on something that I felt I already knew, um, and I was looking for more what next. And... Um, there was really no what next. They don't really walk you through it. And so for someone new to the topic, um, yeah, it was a pretty cold realm and, and I didn't get a lot of support, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in retrospect, there were things I could have done differently. I could have reported it to the police. I could well, have that would get that to more agencies. Well, that's what I did with my UFO sighting. What was and your it, and, and it got me absolutely nowhere. So you had a UFO sighting too. I had a UFO sighting, but it was nothing like what you had. I saw a disc basically fly over me and stop and then go small. off on an angle toward Monterey. And, and I called the, uh, wow. uh, the police department there and they put wow. me on hold for 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. was very the woman was very sarcastic. I finally hung up. So I didn't know how I did, never thought of looking online to see right. if there was any way to report a UFO. I had no idea this is in 2006. But. And Lord forbid that they put in the paper Martin Willis claims to have seen oh, no. UFOs. And I'm not that important. Not. <laughs> that, was my, yeah. that was my big fear, though, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, for somebody that has a family, I'm respected by my peers, and I would like to be taken seriously. To say UFO in a sentence with a straight face to anyone is really difficult outside yeah. of outside of the UFO population. Um, well, I will tell you this. It's easier now um, ever since 2017 in the New York Times coming out yeah. with the, the story about the Pentagon well, investigating. It's well, more sensational. Um, so, I mean, it, it's just my personal experience with it is that outside of people that are already interested in it, it's really hard to be taken seriously. And I sure. say this in, 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 with my family being um, part of that as well. They saw this and to talk to them individually today, they would each give you a different perspective. Um, so I find it very interesting too. There's definitely a psychology behind experiencing something like this. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it originates with the phenomenon or if it originates with us psychologically and how we interpret that information. Because slowly but surely, over the next couple of weeks to a month, my family individually forgot this sighting. Very strange. They don't forget anything. I mean, wow. they don't forget anything. And they forgot this sighting and it, I have to throw pebbles at them to get them to recall it. 
Um, and this was another reason why I was so frustrated with MUFON's response. And I say MUFON's response. It's it's not their responsibility. That is a group of volunteers. Yes. Yeah. And it's not their responsibility to hand walk me through my case. Um, however, I was seeing my individual family members forgetting details. Um, and I wanted this case to get more time. I wanted them to interview my family, which they didn't do. I wanted somebody third part, not me, you know, um, the way things are going now, and we'll talk about it. I have a project going where I am interviewing my family to get their statements before it disappears. My parents are in their late eighties. Um, you know, and I would love to have had my family on with you today, but you would find it disappointing without me. I, I, I don't want to say helping them recall, but I, I, I almost have to just say certain words and then they'll give you their spiel. They'll, I have to give them a trigger. And then they'll, like, if I say to my mom, remember that day, she'll say, yeah, we were down at the beach and um, that will be it um, generally. And then I'll say something like, do you remember seeing anything in the sky? And she'll say, oh yeah, I remember seeing that light. And I'm like, did you hear anything? She'll say, yes. And she'll describe what she heard. But if I just come at her, she has no recollection. It's, it's strange because you could ask her what she did for her fifth grade school in the 80s for um, a project and she'll know every detail. Yeah. Martin, it, it's very strange. Um, I don't know how to interpret that information. It's strange. Let me, let me just pop this question up here. And uh, this is by um, ERRT Radio. Did you have any mental connection? In other words, was there? It gives me chills to just see that written because probably, probably because I can't get it out of my head. You know, it's not, I never thought about this before, but now I am researching. I'm online. Did this happen right, right after? after it, I'm pretty sure. Pardon ahead. me. Did this happen right after or your interest remained ever since it happened? Or was there like a, a, a cool off time where you, you didn't think no about cool it? cool off time for me. I felt like I was um, kind of invading on my family when I would bring it up. But it was on my mind a lot. It wasn't on their mind at all, any of them. Um, and so even, so my sister's oldest, he was the one that cried out, oh, look, a saucer. He's, if you were to ask him about it today, he'll say, oh yeah, like we totally saw a saucer. That was great. But he has no details. He has no, I mean, maybe he will as he gets a little older, but at this point it was just kind of like, yep. That's, you know, he's young enough to be in that group. He's still a highly intelligent kid and he is getting, you know, his degrees in university right now. Hmm. But at the same rate, it's still something that was just kind of like, yeah, I, I feel like the younger generation, perhaps Martin is way accepting of this and they're on another level where, you know, this is an acceptable reality. And so that's another part of the psychology. I feel like he's forgotten the details because he was like, yeah, no big deal. You know what I mean? Um, and that actually seems like that could have been the case for a couple of my family members. Um, and I, I've gone back to them lightly at this point because I don't want to muddy the waters. I've gone back to them lightly to see if any of them recall anything. And um, some do and some don't and that's cool because um i told you about the eight and those are the adults my little kids were there too and so my my youngest son is like i remember everyone talking about it but nobody wow. else in the family even remembers talking about it yeah so i think it it really go it's probably not just 
you know, say a UFO sighting. It, but it really kind of goes to show that everybody handles something differently. Right. You know, whenever there's a tragedy, whenever there's something that happens, um, everybody has right. their own little way of handling it. But I feel like high impact, low impact. Hmm. You know what I mean? That really comes into play here because we saw these things really cruising. I mean, that Tic Tac did something incredible. We saw that beam come out clearly. You know, that wasn't minor. That was major for us all to see. Um, we saw a box popping things in and out, potentially of who like knows. Like a portal where. in a way, right? I mean. Would you consider that's what you thought you were seeing? I hate saying it. I yeah. hate. Yeah. Yeah, Martin. <laughs> I mean, that is exactly what I saw. It, so clearly. So clearly. Um incredible absolutely mesmerizing and that was why i wanted to softly bring this out and so um i wrote an email to uh nick at the ufo chronicles podcast and just thought you know if i could just bring it out softly um and see if anyone else potentially had seen anything that day that was my big go for with coming out was to see if we could corroborate this in public, you know, do something with that community that is so vast. Um, and so far I haven't had anything corroborating my sighting on this on the 5th of July. Um, now what about, what about you talk about corroborating has no one else saw as far as MUFON knows, right? And no so, one else reported this. So what about Peter Davenport? Well, this is the site. beauty of MUFON is when I directly asked. So um, initially, not a lot of communication frustration. Um, up until a couple of months ago, um, I was in contact again with MUFON with the um, director of MUFON for Washington State. And what an incredible person he is and highly knowledged. Um, and not to stray too far from your question there, but um, he gave me all the data on my case. So I was able to review it um, and there was extensive data. Um, was that your question? Sorry. Um, well, no, just to wonder why, uh, you know, the, did they actually seek out other, you know, to see if there were other witnesses, no one else called it in. And I also, Pardon me. I also mentioned the National UFO Reporting Center uh, with Peter Davenport, which is actually in Washington. Right. I don't, I don't know if you contacted them. I or missed out on that. Them. I, yeah. Um, I unfortunately didn't didn't know about it. But it's actually something you can still check to see if. But a lot of times they okay. they move on and them kind of work together. Right. Uh, when there's a, a sighting that's reported, but and I would I still check it out. MUFON definitely did their research. I know they checked with um, other agencies. There was, um, they had talked to the airport and the two military bases that I believe are right there. And there should have only been one plane in the air at that time. And in my first photograph, you see it. You can see the plane in my first photograph. So it's beautiful corroborating information. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. And you can totally make out the plane in the far background, you can it, it's further away than the saucer, and you can make out fuselage, tail. Um, you can make out the shape of this plane, no problem, in the far background on its descent. And then you can see in the foreground, high up in the sky, the, the saucer I have depicted there with the two portals kind of up on the top. Now, I didn't actually notice a picture of, you're, you're saying you have a picture of the saucer? Yep, you showed it. It was that. That's the very okay. So great. Let's look at this. If you want to show your audience this at this point, this is um, a pretty good look at what I was looking at. That is a non-zoomed-in photograph of the Tic Tac. Uh, I believe at that point that may be it recoiling the portal. <laughs> back up into itself. Um, so, 
Yeah. In this 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 picture here, which one is this one? That is a close up of the one you just showed. I see. So there's the tic tac. If in you, the in the background, or is it, it closer? On top. I horizontal see. Line. That's a tic tac. Mm -hmm. There's a slight beam. You can kind of make out a little line, and then that is a photo of that 3D square retracting at that point. Um, in one of the wide shots, I have it out in a box, if you can scroll through and find that. But this is a great photo because you can see the beam. Yeah, I don't I don't know. If first, I, that's the first photo, and that's, that's yeah. No, I don't believe I have that one. Um, but anyway, okay. I'll just move on. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to show the map, I sure. can kind of show a sequence. So down there, you see where I was looking, the direction I was pointing, and then all of those dots were photographs. So I had photographed all of those and the photographs that I have line up with each of those dots. The green line down the center is my estimation of where these objects traveled from and to during the time I sighted them. I have no idea where they were before and I don't know where they went after, but um, it definitely seemed like they were on a mission. They were definitely coordinated. Um, and so my also my estimation is that I was between seven and nine miles away from them. So pretty good camera considering the distance, you know. Um, now I could be off and MUFON kind of had some corroborating info on this stuff. So I, I feel good about this, but um, this is my, my take on, on that scenario. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, someone had put in the, in the um, chat earlier um, that they wondered if you thought that the noise that your mother heard was a breaking of the sound barrier or something else. Right. So this is great because I did hear something, I believe, when that portal opened and it corroborated with what my mom had said originally she had said it sounded like a balloon being blown up without the without being able to hear the air so you know how rubber sounds when it expands yeah mm -hmm. that was the sound she heard but loud i guess mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. trying to imagine a balloon expanding strange description but that is kind of what it sounded like um yeah tubular it had a tubular sound to it um when it was actually moving across the sky there was no noise um i i used the word popping or shuddering but there was no noise um it just seemed to appear stop and then it would reappear but very rapidly very very rapidly appearing and disappearing that's why some of my photos show nothing. It's very odd. And the reason I feel that they were in sync was because in a photo where there was nothing, there was nothing. And then in photos where there were objects, they were all there. So that data led me to think that they were somehow coordinated and in phase or in sync all hypothetical stuff I'm saying right now, obviously. Um, but now, um, that was interpretation. Now the um, w the other one you send me, I'm I'm not going to put it up right at this second, but it shows what almost looks like lightning. The sky looks darker. Is it the same area? No, no. Oh, so it's a whole different thing. Totally different thing. Oh, okay. So I won't even. All right, we'll, yeah. we'll go there later. Later. But, um, yeah. Um, so as far as the time goes that this took place, I know um, it sounds like a lot happened, but was it in a short time? Two minutes. About two minutes. Two minutes is a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Depending on what's happening, you're right. <laughs> it was a long time. Um, so it's hard for me to really feel that, though, because – a lot of that time was me just sitting there in awe. And I mean, awe. Yeah. I, I, 
I get that. I take yeah. as many photos as I could. But at the same, I had to remind myself to take photos, kind of. And I, I, I was photographing the clouds, not the objects, because they were moving so fast. So, like, I would see something and I'd be like, all right, boom, I'm going to photograph that little sparkle I just saw near that cloud. And then luckily, some of my photos would have it. But a lot of times I would see something and photograph it. And I know in that photo there was nothing. It was because either my shutter speed was off or my hand speed was off. I was missing the objects. And the photo is kind of like FPS, you know, your, your frames per second. Are they moving so fast that my shutter can't pick it up? Or are they really not there? You know, they're not ducking behind haze. There's no clouds that low. These were in clear skies. There was nothing blocking our view. Um, now, when this when this ended, did it end in a way that moved, or did it end like a blink out? It was so bizarre. It was so bizarre. And 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 my mental state right after was so bizarre too. Um, okay. So that portal closed and the objects just shuddered off the way they had off into the distance to a point where I could not see them anymore. I fired off some other photos and then I started taking pictures of sailboats. Why? I, I don't know. Um, I have some family photos right there and then, which is to be expected. But a lot of other photos of things that were just in the water and some of like tr a tree that was kind of near my truck. And I was like, I remember taking them and just being like, wow. Like I had this weird, like I was in a weird headspace right after it. Um, and I think my whole family was, to be completely honest, because it was distracting me. Something was distracting me away from what I had just seen. My my the sequential photos from that day are a little not. They're they're not normal photos for me to be taking, and so it was just odd. And when you look at the whole sequence of photos on my phone, you're just kind of like, this tells a strange story. Yeah, uh, we just to let you know, we have about seven minutes before we go into our first break. Okay. But um, I, I kind of sense now this is a sense. Uh, I may be totally off on this, but is this an emotional thing for you? Um, frustrating. It's a frustrating topic for me because it's outside of the box that mm -hmm. I am used to. Yeah, And so it's information that's baffling. It was unexplainable. And so that eats me up. Yeah. Uh, it's got a big piece of me. I think I want to solve it. I, I, I see things on the news. I'm like, that is definitely not a UFO. I know what that is. <laughs> um, there are so many things that I'm just like, everything is from this planet. Like, that's what I've been raised on. I can explain most things away. And I've seen some incredible things. Um, in fact, I know you only have a few minutes, but, um, no, we have, we have time. Dan Aykroyd talked in an interview about a pink spiral that he saw in the eighties. Mm -hmm. I witnessed that. I witnessed the, same that. One. the yeah. same one. And you guys can research that. It's a really cool sighting. I ran into the house and dragged my dad out and he saw it with me. Huh. A pink spiral in space. This was in space. Did and, anyone ever look to see sometimes rocket launches? Right. And that's weird things. It was a Chinese, they said it was a Chinese rocket. Oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be fine with that, except everything I know now. <laughs> yeah. You know, everything I know now makes me say that wasn't. And you can read some articles. There's really interesting articles that came out about that sighting because it wasn't just me. They saw it all over the East Coast. Um, yeah. And so tons of research came out about it. But, you know, my family heard Chinese rockets and we forgot about it. Uh -huh. We were fine with that as a description. The same way if MUFON had come back and said, this is one of ours, you should destroy those photos. I would have been fine with that. I'm a patriot. Okay. I am the last guy that's going to burn the U.S. for some cool UFO photos. If it's a secret, I don't want to release it. No way. 
And this was not ours. What I photographed was not ours. And I can appreciate people that believe that UAPs and discs and uh, these Tic Tacs are ours and drones. Sorry, what I saw, that's not our technology. That was not our technology. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I felt when I had my sighting, which was not dramatic at all. But let me just pop, pop this question up for Mary Grace, um, because uh, she wanted to know, this was when you were talking earlier about your family not remembering. And mm -hmm. basically, the uh, do you think that some people just don't think too deeply about it because they don't want to remember it? Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I think it's, it's, it's a scary reality. You know, I think to, to entertain that it might be something yeah. not from this earth, mostly. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just strange. And, you know, I am going to film the interviews with my family to watch their first like to, I'm going to try and catch them off guard. <laughs> I'm going to try to do because when they're not prepared for me to talk about this topic, it's almost like they have to fight a block. Mm hmm. They have to fight a block to recall things. And their first their first facial thing is a smile. They'll smile like an uncomfortable smile, like a like a chimp smile. It's very strange. And I don't quite know how to uh, put it into words. Do I feel like they're blocked? Yeah, I definitely feel like they're blocked. It's so frustrating because for something so incredible for them to forget or just to put in the in a box as uh, oh yeah it was just a UFO, that is devastating. To think that they saw that, they reviewed the photos. They were like, "Yep, that's what we saw." And I'm like, "So what do you guys think it was?" And you know, they're like, "It was a UFO or ours." And I'm like, well, "What do you think it was doing?" I'm like. That was definitely a portal. Uh, I forget the word my dad had used. He didn't call it a portal. I'll remember it. He, he came up with a very novel term for it. Um, but I do think that um, there's uh, a temporary unintentional disassociation. Okay, and in my notes, that's what I have called this, a temporary disassociation that's unintentional. It makes a lot of sense. It, they don't care about it all of a sudden, or they've already put it into a box. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think I think that can very well happen. I've told a number of times, um, this quick story I'll tell you um, cool. on the show is um, I have a friend who's, He's actually active on the Antiques Roadshow, and he had a, an absolute incredible sighting, in my opinion. And that's um, he was at Amherst um, College in Massachusetts, and they were in the tower. And this thing came down. There were four or five of them in the same room. Came down, he said, in the mall, and was up around their floor, about the fifteenth floor, or down a little bit, I think he said. Wow. And it was the shape of a box with lights blinking all around it. And then it shot up toward the mountains and then jets came and it burst into five lights and the lights made all these, you know, synchronized blinking and stuff. And then it shot off. The lights all shot off. And with, when the jet came and I said to him, I said, isn't that the most crazy thing that must totally change your life? And he goes, I could give a, you know what? <laughs> right. So that's but, how where, different people like he, he just like it meant nothing to him. Like, I, you know, but that was kind of his attitude about everything. Um, but still, I thought well, it was a very interesting attitude. I, I actually have been working on this subject this past yeah. year. And we're going to be talking about that, but we do yeah. have to go into break. We're going to talk about that right after break. And That's I did cool. want to announce uh, for those of you in YouTube, you're going to have a treat because it's a little clip of a um, interview that I did with Selma Siddick from the Ariel um the Ariel incident back in 1994. And we have a little clip of that. And for you, those of you over at uh, KGRA radio, we'll be right back right after these messages. We were having um, our recess. Uh, I was 11 years old in a rural town of um, Zimbabwe called Rua. 
Uh, the school used to be a farm, so it was a pretty rural school and very small at the time. It was very, um, still fairly new. So I think Randy, Randall told me that they weren't, they weren't more than 200 students. I thought it was three, but yeah. I think it was 280 or something. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, so not a lot. So our classes were pretty small. But we were having recess and um, I was with my usual friends, as you do, we're eating our lunch and we saw something um, shiny uh, a ways away in, in the bush. It was pretty much bush because uh, apart from the playground, it was all, it was, it's a savanna region, so there was very tall grass um, and a lot of trees and a lot of, um, a lot of like copies, which I guess are like, uh, it's a very like a stony hill, so a lot of granite rock. Um, so we saw something shiny over on these copies and then it was flashing you could see it and then you couldn't see it or it could have actually been flashing we couldn't I, I can't I still don't know today but it was incredibly incredibly bright um, and very different from anything we had seen before and then um, my friend who I was standing next to she and I saw um, like a being I guess and if there were multiple beings I don't know, but they all looked exactly the same. And did you actually walk toward the object? We did not walk towards the object. We walked toward um, the the barrier of the playground, which is sort of where the being was, but not cross the barrier. We didn't cross the barrier. So it was really a lot of, you know, we were inquisitive. What What is this? I don't know what this is. And it's sort of, you know, any human being is going to try and rationalize what it is that they're seeing. And as an 11-year-old, we couldn't couldn't really put into words what it was we were seeing and, and trying to justify it and so you know it was uh, very in, in like a human-esque form um, but much shorter um, really big head really big eyes if it did have a nose couldn't really see it but also the the, the, the skin pigmentation was very very different it was very odd it was nothing like I'd ever seen before um, and the closest thing that I could um, compared what it was wearing would be something like a scuba diving suit. It was just very form-fitting, very black, um, a little shiny at times. Um, but I don't know if that was just the sun. It was a pretty, pretty warm day. It was a beautiful day. Every day is beautiful in Zimbabwe, actually. Um, so it was, it was just a very normal day, and then this happened. Um, it was very, very immense, very intense, and clearly has changed my life. So, yeah, in a now, nutshell, that's it. Yeah. Did you did you walk away when this was happening, or did you stay there until it walked away, or turned away, or went away? Yeah. No. I actually, um, I actually broke my eye lock with it um, because I wanted to go and check on my brother and sister who were much younger and playing in a different part of the playground. Um, because I felt that if I was afraid, then they must be terrified too. Um, but there are a lot of other things that happened during this interlocking moment um, that I go into in, in my uh, piece tomorrow. Uh, but once I let go of my friend's hand and I disconnected from that gaze, which was not an easy thing to do at all, I feel like it took every ounce of, of effort and energy from me and I felt absolutely exhausted afterward. Um, Coming back in about 10 seconds, Martin. Stand by. In three, two, one, go. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, this is Martin Willis, and I'm with my guest, uh, Tem Senor. And uh, uh, for those of you on YouTube, uh, if you want to watch that, that's that whole interview is on my channel. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting interview and it has a lot of views and that's just a clip of it so uh tim welcome back and uh uh interesting uh very interesting um sighting that you had and Absolutely. one that just seems like you know it can't it can't be explained um i don't think did you at any time um think about maybe putting on your video or you did actually video some of it is that right or not? Um, no. No, there's there's no video to share at this point. Um, so they're still investigating the case. And Mufan was pretty clear that there's a lot of stuff I still 
they would rather me not share because it's property of MUFON, it's their data. Um, and so part of that might be their review of that data. But everything that I can share, I want to share. And as soon as it's released and they've cleared it to me or whatever uh, entity is in control of that information, as soon as it's in the clear, I will absolutely share anything. I The whole reason I came out this way was so that people could see that there is a new story that is much more recent than some of the previous Tic Tac cases that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are other sightings. However, this one is extremely dynamic. I felt that it needed to be put out in the public eye ASAP. And would you say that um, how many um, craft or objects or whatever they were, was it just two, a disc and a single uh, so-called Tic Tac or cigar shaped? So there were two of them? There was one Tic Tac? Yeah. Coordinating in synchronicity with two other objects in finality three. Mm -hmm. So my last few photos show three discs and one Tic Tac. Three discs. So my hypothesis is that that portal brought one more in to coordinate with the others that were traveling south. Hypothetically, if you look at the photos in sequence, that's the event that takes place. There's two ships flying in coordination with the Tic Tac, traveling down to West Seattle. The Tic Tac fires a beam hypothetically a second time in my photos, um, allowing a third ship to join the group, at which point the Tic Tac and now three ships continue their direction south, south um, off in the distance where I was unable to take any photos at that point. I'm going to put a couple of um, things up here because people are making kind of a good point here. Um, what, uh, and move on controlling the narrative. That is the... Uh... Only because they were very clear with me that they wanted me to have the data because I'd been asking for it, but they didn't want me to share it with the public because it was MUFON property. Just their data, the information that they Oh, I see. Just the work that they did, not your things. Correct. Correct. So um, any video that I have absolutely will be shared. Okay. That's the question. Any information I have that is my property, I will share. And at this point, that's 100% of what I have. You have it, and I'll share it. Um, MUFON wants to keep their data close to... Uh, you know, themselves, that's fine. Um, that was my frustration, because what next? So what now, Move on. Um, I, I, I was frustrated. Um, I think th the big uh, takeaway from that, and this was the, um, the director was even saying that for me to add to my case was simply for my benefit. Um, some frustrating details, but at the same rate, very supportive, um, you know, in corroborating some of the information I was looking for, their math and their physics, um, their scientists that they brought to the table, the fact that they could rule out weather, they could rule out a lot of the things that I wouldn't have had access to made them great. They were great for the, for corroborating or for, um, fact checking, let's call it fact checking to make sure that this was real UAP. So they definitely closed the case as UAP, or I'm sorry, um, gave it a UAP insignia. However, it is still an ongoing open case. Sorry, it's an I ongoing see. open case. Um, but um, there's it's up to me to move the case forward in any way I see fit at this point because. Um, he said that that is that information is made available to their um, their representatives for their people to, if they choose, uh, further research. I see. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, um, so I th I think it's it's something you know you might. It's probably just one of these things, and you know a lot of people have sightings that. 
they just see and they never question them like you are? They never, uh, they just kind of like move on? I'm new to that organization and I sat in on one of their um, live uh, talk talks they have. I sat in on the last one and listened in. They don't know anything more than we do. They don't know anything more than we do. Um, their researchers are highly skilled. The people that volunteer are well-educated. The fact that they can do our fact-checking for us is fantastic. But if you want to take it to the next level, that's it. All they're going to do is confirm whether, you know, to explain it away, because they're there to close cases. They want to see if it's weather. If it's weather, great. If it's something of ours, great. That's what they're there for. But if they come back with that, you're in the 5%, but now you're on your own. Because really, there's no organization out there to take it to the next level. And if they, if there is, they haven't gotten a hold of me yet. And yeah, I don't think that's, I don't think that's how that works. I don't think generally. It is. I have no idea. And to yeah. be honest, I, I'm yeah. just an open book. All I did was see something and photograph it. I really yeah. just. Someone yeah. asked if you had contacted, I'll just answer the question. I mean, I'll ask the question this way. Was there anyone else besides MUFON that you contacted about this? Unfortunately not. Uh -huh. And I regret that. Yeah. I mean, but I will tell you, I will tell you this, you can still contact, um, you know, the National UFO Reporting Center, right. Peter Davenport in the state of Washington. Right. And, um, and just tell them you did already report it to move on, but um, you feel like maybe... What, what What's the next step, though, really, Martin? What can Peter Davenport do that MUFON hasn't? Uh, my Well, the only thing I'm thinking of is maybe someone else saw this. Spreading the net. Right. Spreading the net. Um, for me personally, um, I mean, yeah, you know what? I, I should and I will just to do that. But at this point, I, I know what we saw. Um it's not explainable. It's, it's, it's in that realm. And so I'm convinced of that now, you know, and I've had enough people to look at it professionally to say, yeah, that's something odd. That's really all I needed at that point. I'm totally cool with taking the next steps of getting some good interviews from my family um, and making a case for it, putting a documentary together, um, you know, and putting it out there for free to people so they can see the full interviews and they can see all the data that I'm allowed to release. They can see any video that there is and all of that. So the video is not good and the video isn't going to help. I can tell you right now. Yeah. It didn't help and it hasn't helped me. That's the way it is a lot of times with the video, especially if you're doing it on your phone. Um, I don't know. Is that what you used your phone also? Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. That, That's why I don't even mention it because it's so frustrating. Yeah. Um, some odd little outside notes on the recording of that. I went through later and edited those videos, uh, those photos, meaning that I would delete one. I'd look at it and be like, oh, there's nothing in that. Delete. And then realize later there could have been information there. Uh. And it's like you're almost entranced to delete the information. It was strange. I almost got rid of everything at one point, fearing that it was a military secret. Do you have an iPhone? I do. Well, it's fact, too late now. But This is the actual phone that I took those photos with. I still have <laughs> but, it. I, I've upgraded since, but I still have the original hard drive here with all of the original information. Well, and just, I have just undeleted to... all of the photos. They're all still there. Yeah. All the info is still there. Just a little side note. If you have an iPhone and you delete a picture, you can go into albums and undelete. Which so, I did. Which, which I did. did I see. Yeah. But it was this strange mentality of just frustration of ah, delete, delete. You know what? Delete the whole thing. It's very strange because. You would say that you were acting different than normal. I don't do that. That's something I, I don't edit my my photos, I've got thousands of horrible photos. <laughs> it doesn't matter to so me. So do I. <laughs> for some reason, I found myself doing that. And in fact, even in the past, when I've had strange photos of things in the sky, I don't know if they were real or not, but I deleted them. Why? Why did I do that? Yeah. Strange. I know I'm not alone on that. 
I've heard of people destroying evidence before. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Well, I would like to now, if it's, if you're all right with it, if we can move on and talk about kind of a, a synchronicity that you had happened right. um, because you're also a producer Correct. and you were contacted about doing a show on UFOs. <laughs> it's not in my resume uh, at all. Um, I do music yeah. videos and I do commercials, but I was approached to do a UFO documentary. And in fact, um, to do a yearly annual documentary. So um, it, it's kind of a, a sequential hour to two hour show called UFO Project 2021. And it's in the works right now. And my case is going to be in there in the first documentary. And I'm going to include everything I can. Um, and, and when can we look for the that to be actually out? I'll, and where will people actually find it? I'll update you. It's going to be released for free. Um, and it'll be on network telly. Network telly? Network television. Oh, I thought this was something I hadn't heard of. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I'll make it free for everyone. Um, so this project is incredible, actually. Um, so coming into this um, as uh, a non-believer, if you will, I was offered this position because they wanted somebody that would be able to actually kind of just document and not have an opinion. Obviously, that's the way that works. Um, and so coming across some of the stories that I've found just here locally, um, some pretty incredible corroborating information as far as portals go. Uh, some great video of um, electrical storms that seem to be creating portals, or if, if you're a believer of this sort of thing, and so here's, uh, we'll just go through these. Uh, these are photos taken in low light of an electrical storm here in Oregon. And it appears in some of the photos, there's lightning strikes that actually form. You can see down the lower portion there, a triangle in the bolt. So the video that this is taken from all of this was silent. You can hear the people talking, but you don't hear any thunderclap. And this was in this guy's backyard. So lightning, um, changing colored lightning, where it would go from blue to pink and form shapes. You can see a triangle here. And then in the very next sequence, uh, a portion of a second later, after this clap of lightning, if you move on to the next... Yeah, I, um, they didn't. They and didn't actually, download right. So oh, okay. Yeah, the next still actually shows a large shape coming through that location right where the triangle is. I'll try to. I'll try to get those up. But um, so this was taken. You actually saw the the original video. Yep. Yep. We have the original video. It's high definition. It's beautiful, and this is a still taken from it. And it's just very odd. It's one of those things where you're, you're kind of in a little bit of disbelief and you're like, no way, no way. <laughs> I don't know if this, yeah, this is another. Yeah, that's yeah. that's part of the same sequence. So you can kind of see that this all just took place in this guy's backyard and this thing just pops in. Um, in the next photos, if you do have them, they're a little bit dark. There's one that shows a, a halo. That's not it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time with they it. didn't all come. They didn't all come through for some reason. So in the next in the next shot, there's a large halo around that uh, pink lightning. And then in the very next shot, it's all you can see is a large, very large disc coming up at an angle kind of it, it, in the next photo. Unfortunately, I, do you have the next one? Um, it's up. Uh, is there some blue to it? Yeah, yeah, I'll try to get that up. Okay. Um, and so it, it looks like this ginormous saucer kind of popping in. And, uh, and is that what happened afterwards? I mean, this to me, it, it looks yeah, like it's all part of an electrical situation, but are, right. 
Right. I mean, and then it just goes silent. There's no thunderclap. It's very strange. Um, there's no ship present after this. So um, if there is something coming in or out, um, it was not visible to. Is this the image up there now? There's yeah, that's some... the halo. So that's kind of like there was an explosion kind of pop, a silent visual pop, if you will. And then in the following photo, it kind of gets a little dark, but you can see a saucer shape. Yeah. I in... apologize for the people on YouTube. Oh, no, that's I my can't... probably. They're big photos and they're big files. Yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, can't get that. But anyway, uh, yeah. so that's interesting. So that's one of the ones that will be featured in, in this. Uh, right. And so that out. will be all stuff that's taken place um, on the West Coast in 2019 and 2020 and we're going to be putting that out this year this is just one case we have multiple i also have some first-hand witnesses that have had um actual alien interactions supposedly with portals again so um an important feature to this project is that you have to have some video or film documentation so Everything I, that we put into this will have some documentation to it and be able to be, you know, looked at and reviewed. How, how do you find these things? Do do you work? How, who do you work with to find? Can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to no, kill. No, my own resources. Um, I actually just when I was assigned the project, um, I was given a couple of witnesses, and then I think I posted somewhere uh i think oh, I like facebook that. or something like that i'm not sure where i have some assistants that potentially helped me do some of that pr but um we definitely reviewed a lot of cases um the big factor is to have some film or video or photo evidence because it's a story is a story and I, and I say this all the time now because I've really been inundated with a lot of people that have great stories and stories are fantastic. And I believe you, you know, and I believe you believe it, but without something photographic, it's hard to revisit and it's hard to even get the details right. If I didn't have the photos from my sighting, I might forget parts, honestly. And I feel like the way the phenomenon works, it wants you to forget. Like, it doesn't want to be recalled. It doesn't want to be photographed. Anyone that has this experience will understand kind of what I'm saying. It's a very strange feeling. It's almost like either an obsession or a brainwash. And there doesn't seem like there's any in between because not every family member that witnessed my sighting had the same recollection or the same ability to recall. Um, the same way. They'll all tell you that it happened. They'll all tell you that they saw something and their recollections will all be different. Yeah. Um, and well, I, know I think um, as I, told, I mentioned off, off air that if it ever happens again, it's a good, a good lesson for anyone out there is um, for um, if there's multiple witnesses for, and for anyone, even if you're witnessing alone is to stop everything you're doing, go somewhere quiet and write, down exactly everything you possibly can about what you saw. And when there's multiple witnesses and everyone goes off their own way, doesn't say a word to each other and writes it all down, then you have accuracy. Um, and you have to do it right away while it's fresh. And, and otherwise, uh, your memory changes, you know, and like it's very obvious what you're talking about. Your whole family um, all think, you know, I mean, they're not they're not making much of it like like you are, but also um, some of them are forgetting totally yeah. that it even happened and, I, and filed and it away somehow. I think a big portion of that was just complete acceptance of it. Once um, I told them about it, I was like, you know, MUFON came back with this being a real UAP. They were like, oh, cool. And that was kind of it. Um, there wasn't like a, I, I guess a big response. Is it that not big of a deal that there could potentially be alien life here? I, I thought that was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's a little strange um, because really at the time when we were doing the math 
everyone was excited. Everyone was excited at the table when they were recalling things freshly. Yeah. Um, and then that just dissipated so rapidly, so yeah. rapidly. And I feel like there is definitely a, like a mental knock-on effect from a sighting where you personally probably interpret it and then just box it up. Either you're cool with thinking about it a lot and it's like, wow, or you're like, it's not possible. And so disregard, perhaps. Um, and then perhaps there's another one where it's just like, that is just too much for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's a big thought to really admit to yourself that we're being visited. That's a really big statement um, because I'm all about life in the universe, definitely, absolutely. But the travel part is the part, you know, the getting here. That's always the hold up, um, you know, and I've, you know, maybe I've said this before, you know, maybe who, if we are being visited from elsewhere, wherever that elsewhere is, maybe they've figured out something about physics that we haven't figured out yet or something yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm opening the lines uh, now so anyone can call in. And uh, if you have a question for our guests and that um, actually I'd like to do something a little different here, if it's okay with you, if someone would like to talk about their own sighting, I think, uh, and share it with us. I think that would also be good if uh, if you didn't have a direct uh, question for Absolutely. our guest. And Bill, Bill is waiting by and screening calls. So again, that number is 855, or did I say it at all? 855-472-5483. And uh, Bill is standing by. Also, Martin, I was going to add to that. If people are interested in getting involved with the UFO project that I'm putting together oh. and we have data to share, um, they can get in contact. And if with your permission, I'll give an email address. Okay. I did have someone that had uh, quite an interesting sighting okay. that uh, has contacted me. And, uh, oh, you know what? I don't think they have a picture. I don't think they have. I think they okay. made a rendition of what they saw. I think that's what it is. Yeah. But, it's so rare, Martin. Yeah. Photographs and video is rare. And so the stuff that I've managed to come up with is incredible. And the fact that I was able to photograph something personally was incredible. Yeah. Um, because that you even thought to do it is incredible. It was so fast. It was so yeah. fast. And you could have looked right at it and not seen it, which was the other really strange thing. Because the Tic Tac, it, unless I had been looking for it, I wouldn't have seen it. It was the same color as the background, practically. Um, and that could definitely be why these things aren't noticed. I'm sure it's happening all the time. Now that I've seen this, I'm sure it's happening all the time. Um, I don't think that necessarily it shows up on radar all the time. Um, I know that it has. I know that the data is there, you know, um, in previous cases and with Nimitz. But um, I don't think that my case really was like Nimitz in any way other than that it involved a Tic Tac. I mean, it was incredible to think that, just to think that it was a Tic Tac creating a portal, I think is the hardest portion of this really to take away. Because um, I would have been fine thinking I'd just seen a spaceship um, <laughs> or a Tic Tac or anything, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. But the fact is that it performs something that we need to be knowing, we need to pay attention to that. Because that now proves that this is not a man-made object. This is not an Earth origin craft. We don't have that technology. So my father was involved in some of this stuff through Xerox and they had some pretty incredible stuff in the eighties, but there's no way that we have the ability to fire a laser in that capacity to perform any kind of light anomaly in the sky. We don't have controlled lasers. They don't end at a distance. You can't calculate right. a distance for a laser. It's ongoing. 
just there's a lot of science there that you're looking at with your eyes and you know is impossible. Yeah. And that's incredible to think about. And that's the big takeaway I want your audience to know and to kind of contemplate would be that this could potentially explain what these Tic Tac UAPs are and what they're doing. Because if you look back at Fravor's case, is that his name? Yep, David Fravor. David Fravor's case with the Tic Tac, it was hovering over something in the ocean, perhaps performing some sort of whatever. Same sort of thing we saw, coordinating with another object. However, this time it happened to be in the air. Um, maybe that's what Fravor saw was the end of that tic tac beaming that giant whatever it was under the water to that location or perhaps performing repairs because i'm sure these things need upkeep as well and so so, perhaps so what uh, dave, dave altman is uh yeah uh, asking this question xerox laser xerox and lasers they have, were in development of that sure so Xerox had their hand in everything, um, laser printer, fuserol technology. So my dad has lots of patents on his wall. Uh, one of the patents is for a polymer, which is a rubber that was sprayed onto a fuserol, which is a, a tube in a copying machine. That rubber, when it rubs on another fuserol, creates static, and that static feeds the paper through the machine. Simple. Well, he took that technology and he worked on it a little bit more and he was able to come up with ideas for things like sprayable batteries, a, a printable battery. You can print it on your computer and it can run a little diode or something. The next level of technology would that be you could print a computer. Yeah. You can create it. these things. And they were doing this back in the 80s. That was all stuff that you can actually still find patents on technologies that express a lot of these. Wow. So laser technology has been around for a really long time. You know, uh, it's nothing new. We've got a couple of calls. We have uh, Ronald. Ronald calls in uh, often. Ronald from Minnesota. Uh, welcome to the show, Ronald. Hey, Martin uh, and uh, Tim, great, great show tonight, great guest, and Happy New Year to you guys, and Happy New Year to Bill, and uh, thank you for a great show beginning the year. Um, the question I have for Tim and maybe everyone that has had an experience, one, how do you wrap your head around what you just saw? And you can't just go out and tell on everybody. Obviously, you think you're crazy in the first place when you see something. But uh, how do you how do you really logically and uh, in a in a brave and and bold way go and talk to somebody intelligent and say, "Hey, look, this is what I got. You know, here's here's what I got to tell you." And then you, the other thing is. Why don't everyone see these crap? Like, for instance, I live in a hotbed area of the Midwest, one of them anyway, and I haven't seen a UFO, okay? So I'll go ahead and listen on the air. All right, thank you. All right, hey, thanks, Ronald. Would you like me to take that? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Um. I, I'm not surprised that you've never seen or been able to take a photograph of a UFO. Um, it's not, I mean, I do think it's happening all the time. Do I think it's something visible? Not necessarily. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to produce right now shows evidence of things coming in and out of our timeline that we can't see. We can see them coming and going. I've seen the portals, but I haven't seen necessarily the object. I got lucky. I definitely got lucky. I saw something strange. I ran and grabbed a camera. Having your camera close is so important, um, especially to, and I know most of Martin's audience probably does keep their camera close. 
um, looking for evidence, you're never going to find it. Never going to find it. You can't look for it unless you know of a hotspot. And even knowing of a hotspot doesn't guarantee you a picture um, or an experience. Um, and that's the frustration. Can I just tell you that is the real frustration because um, you do kind of feel a little nuts sharing a story like this or even thinking that you're going and looking for a photo or I know every time I walk out of my house now, I look up, I look up, I scan the skies constantly. Yeah. Same here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's really the only thing you can do. I, I feel for you. I hope that you have an experience, but the fact that you're calling and you're one of Martin's watchers means that you already know. And knowing is the whole battle in my personal opinion, because that was for me, um, I was able to kind of redirect my uh, mental focus, if you will, in my career towards something like this. Um, I know it's an ongoing science and it's an ongoing uh, subject. And so I'm in, I know it's real. Um, I believe Martin's audience knows it's real. They've been shown enough. Um, most of them probably have had experience. Martin, you had an experience. It only takes something believable, I think. Something that changes your paradigm to really open up your world to it just being possible. Am I a 100% believer? No. Um, I can't dive in all the way because science just tells me it's still in my science. It's not possible yet to get here from there. I just saw a portal that would explain it. If they're using portals, wormholes, done deal. They win. That's a science that is a millennium away from us where we are now. Uh, probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I it, yeah. Hey, thank you, Ronald. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Um, one of the things I think is interesting, you know, what you mentioned, if you had a sighting, I, I think it's really interesting when we have people that are dead serious researchers in this topic and they've never had a sighting. They just think there's something to it because mm -hmm. of what people have experienced. And, you know, uh, look at Stan Friedman. He had, you know, a long career, at, you know, a scientist um, in a nuclear a uh, nuclear physicist, I think he was, but, um, you know, he, he was in for the long haul and he never had a sighting yet. He knew there was something to this. And then there's a few out there that I know of, uh, you know, one in particular that invented a new, you know, sighting as a, as a child at uh, nine years old that, you know, he was on my show and said he never had a sighting. And all of a sudden now he has in his books and when he's on TV and everything talking about a sighting, that he had that uh, he admitted he never had a sighting in his life when he was on my show, but now he has. Right. Right. <laughs> so uh, there are, there are, those are the people you have to watch for. Unfortunately, um, yeah. we have another call. We have Bob and Bob is also calling from the great state of Minnesota. Um, other States can call by the way, Bob, <laughs> welcome to the show, Bob. I guess we have the market on it. Uh, yeah. But, but Martin, <laughs> Martin, fantastic show. As always, I consider myself, um, I guess, newer to the UFO field in terms of following it oh, uh, well. you know, de in a dedicated way. Um, but you're one of the first podcasts I started listening to, and I will still say the best. So oh, well, thank praise you. On you. <laughs> thank you. You just made but, my uh, 2021 already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, but, Tim, great, great to hear your story. But you had asked earlier, Martin, about if there was any other sightings. And you guys have been talking about how some people see things and it just it doesn't do anything for them and um much like the other caller from minnesota uh, i'm an avid out outdoorsman and very much into astronomy and i have never seen anything and keep wanting to but it was my father who really kind of i guess made me a believer in ufos because he he had two sightings but for him they were they were nothing, you know, it was as a child, I was fascinated to hear about them, but um, it was not a big deal to him. And he was a, you know, you hear this all the time. He was a very sober individual who, who, you know, 
to my mind, never, never exaggerated, never told stories, but these were just two stories that he, he'd always tell. And, um, you know, I believed them, you know, but to him, they were just nothing. And right. it's, it's weird to me to think that some, some people, you know, whereas if I saw something, um, I, I would be telling everybody <laughs> and, and, and wanting to get to the bottom of it. And for him, he has no desire to want to get to the bottom of what he saw. And can you give just a nutshell of what, uh, what he did see? Sure. My dad was born in 1942. And so when he was 10 years old, so it would have been 52, um, he was actually staying at our old farmhouse. We live in Northern Minnesota and he was, uh, alone in the house, babysitting, um, his younger brother when he, he says that he heard, um, it was getting dark. It was evening or, or getting towards, it was night. It was getting, getting dark. So like I would say probably, you know, um, I think it was August. It's probably around nine o'clock. Um, and, and he said he heard this whirring sound like a, like a, what he said sounds like something spinning, like a woo, 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 kind of sound. And that he, he ran up the stairs and looked out the windows and that the entire, the trees and everything was illuminated with a green a green glow. Um, and in that particular instance, um, he never saw any kind of an object or anything like that. It just, it kind of winked out and, and he never, you know, he, he didn't see anything, but it was that, that it was very peculiar to him. Um, and then the second one, what had happened, uh, somewhere in the, uh, late seventies, he worked at the mines around here and he was coming, coming home, uh, at night off of shift work. And as he came up over the hill, there's a, a field by our house, a farmer's field. And he said there was, there was five lights that were just hovering in the field. Um, and they, you know, they would wink on and off. So it's like there was uh, three on the bottom and two on the top. And they would, in succession, the top would, would, would disappear. And then the bottom would disappear. And then they'd wink back on. And then they'd wink back off again. And... Um, like I said, it's it's hard because you hear a lot of debunkers and and things uh, talk about how you know, and I know ball lightning's been used a lot and everything, but it's very like how my dad describes it is like I was he was able to sit there and uh, you know I know the spot even today it it's not a, a far distance away um, it was a calm night and he could just tell that they were like these illuminated suspended balls that are you know that seemed to have no natural explanation, just, you know, winking on and off. And then, and then that was it, you know, there was, and he, you know, he just turned in the driveway and <laughs> came home and, and, and that was, that was the end of it for him. But he would talk about it. And of course I would, I, I was a child of the eighties. I was born in 1980. And so I was, in, you know, grew up with close encounters of the third kind and all of that kind of stuff. And oh, yeah. I read every book on UFOs from the library and would constantly pick his brain about what he saw. And he would just tell the story. And that was it. It was, he didn't care about anything else. Never thought about aliens. He just like, yeah, well, maybe they're up there. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> and just no interest in, in, further investigating what he saw it's such an odd thing for that that's not a natural response for something unexplainable especially yeah. for you know a kid, a kid who's just watched close encounters he's like you sorry <laughs> what <laughs> i can totally yeah, understand right. yeah for sure do you know were well, there earthquakes kind of out in the area where this took place for him was it an earthquake kind of place or no, no, uh, no, I, I know that I've, I've listened to actually, I think Martin, you've had a guest on talk about, is it geo lighting or something like that? Yeah. That's called. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. And there, there isn't geologic, you know, um, a dead rift Lake Superior is a, a dead rift from, I think millions of years ago, but as far as I know, no geologic activity, um, happening up here at all. To my know kind of a description of what that is. Um, but at the same rate, they don't tend to hover. They usually move around and dissipate. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, Bob, any, any, uh, any questions at all for the guests? Other questions? Um, no, I'm, I'm just very interested to kind of follow. I know you had said that you are looking at making this possibly into a documentary. So I'm Absolutely. kind of interested to see everybody's, uh, um, 
in the interviews and what everybody else has to say surrounding the incident. That's um, I'm kind of fascinated to see what, what happens or what comes out of it. Yeah. Thank well, excellent. Thank you for the call, Bob. Is there any kind of Thank you. All right. Have a good one. So uh, the line is open. And again, that's uh, 855-472-5483. That's, uh, I said it kind of clunky, 855-472-5483. The line's open and Bill will take your call. And I just and, wanted to add to, if people did want to get a hold of me with a story for this project, you can yeah. contact me if that's okay. Can I release that, Martin? Yeah, sure. Like, I mean, I can even, if you want, I can even put your email address right in the, uh, right in the show notes and it'll pop out, uh, pop up as a, uh, you just have to click on it and it'll shoot an email to you. Perfect. It's going to be UFO project 2021 at gmail.com. All right. You'll have to remind me of that. So I get it in the, I will the do. Show notes. Yeah. And, and uh, go ahead. So, so you said you were approached by someone to do this project. And it was just kind of like synchronicity, like you had a sighting yourself. And so I imagine that made you pretty excited to uh, take it on. Absolutely, it did. Um, it, it definitely gave me a direction for the project because it was a little bit open-ended and it allowed me to kind of delve into a bit of research. And so the people that I was coming in contact with, I kind of knew the right questions to ask, if you will. And um, in searching out people to include on the project, I've come up with some incredible, incredible information. Stuff that made me feel like I was not alone with the kind of thing that I saw. Um, this stuff is going on all the time. Um, I have no doubt that you know, if we had the right kind of technology to look up into the skies, we would be seeing a lot more. I don't think it's all going to be seen with infrared or into any of the spectrums we're looking into um, because we don't have it, um, right? We would have it if, if we had that technology. We would have the evidence. Um, there still needs to be lots more science dedicated to this, a lot more research. I would like to see telescopes using um, wider bands and looking into um, a little bit more of the spectrum that we do have control over to be able to look at things that are potentially flying over populated parts of our country. And that was another aspect of why I really felt like it was important for me to get this story of mine out um, was because it was over a populated area. Yeah. Um, I, I, I initially, like I explained, did not want to share this. And a reason that things dragged their feet with MUFON for so long was because I didn't want to send them the data over the internet. I insisted on sending it to them on a thumb drive. Well, that took a week. So they researched that thumb drive. And part of my um, rules with MUFON was that you can't send this digitally either until you've determined that it's not something secret because I know how easy it is to hack. I, I've been hacked and it's horrible. Yeah, I've been hacked um, too. This website, my website was hacked and lost 1500 pages. It's far too easy to hack nowadays. And so if I, the last thing I wanted to do was see my case photos sprawled out somewhere being debunked or potentially just in the wrong hands. Um, at this point, everything I'm making public is public domain. I want the public to have this entire case. Um, I do feel like um, there is no doubt in my mind, not ours. Um, there's no doubt in MUFON's mind, it's not ours. There is no doubt in my family's mind that it is not ours. It was determined back when we saw it, this wasn't ours. You need to make a report, Tim. And that's what I did. And I wish I had done it a little more publicly, but I was scared. Like I said, I, I literally a grown man scared to put this information out because I didn't want to potentially be revealing secrets that I shouldn't be. And, um, you know, I would love a few minutes with uh, guys like Luis Elizondo or anybody in the know, just so that um, I could share this with somebody that would know what to do with the data. And that's who I was really looking for. I was looking for someone I could just pass this off to 
And honestly, I'm not comfortable doing interviews. This isn't something that I wanted to do. I, you know, I initially broke the story with Nick um, through UFO Chronicles podcast, and that's a soft release. I figured that it would get out there, you know, and kind of just let the public feed on that. And then you saw Nick's show, and here I am. I really wish by this point MUFON had just taken it out of my hands, um, given it to the right people, and have that just be worked on in whatever capacity it could be. Um, I'm not really a spotlight guy. I, I'm more of the kind of person that uh, is behind the camera, not in front of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do appreciate that you were willing to come on and talk about it. Um, and and uh, Luis Elizondo now is uh, is more probably more approachable than he's ever been because when he was with um, TTSA, when I was trying to reach him, things like that, they would always say the same thing. Uh, he's traveling. Um, even during COVID, they'd say he's traveling. And I was right. like, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. um, he seems like he, a genuine guy that really looking in the right places and applying the right techniques. Well, he's uh, out of the uh, TTSA himself. And uh, Steve, uh, oh God, I, I'm losing his last name, Steve Justice and uh, Tim Mellon have all, uh, have all kind of struck out on their own to uh, away from the TTSA. And I, I mean, that's what I'm learning I have to do as well. Anyone that has a story, it, it's your story. And I'm realizing now if I wanted to get out there in a real way, um, I'm going to just have to do it. And that's why I was so excited to talk to you because you've had some real minds on your show. And I love the fact that your listeners don't just accept – uh, anything, any story. They are they're clear-minded thinkers, and um, you know it, it's an ever-changing realm. Uh, the UFO topic. There's new information all the time, and y you're getting fed so much stuff: balloons, um, aerofoils, all these things that look so much like UFOs. Oh, it's getting it's getting, it's getting crazy. Worse. <laughs> it, it, here's the big problem: everyone was looking for disclosure. It already happened. You just didn't realize it. When the um, you're not the only one. You're, you're, that's not announced the Space Force. I mean, th if you don't know what that means, then you don't know what disclosure is going to look like. It's happened. So let's just move on. Um, you know, is kind of how I feel. Um, the public is not going to be shocked by UAPs flying over. Um, they just want to know why. What's the intention? They're obviously not interrupting anything. Yeah. We haven't had any airline collisions with this, other than what history has shown as unexplainable pos potential collisions. But I'm saying recently we don't know of anything that it's actually affecting. So, yeah. Yeah, those are the questions. Uh, what are they? Where are they from? And what do they want? Right. Those are the three big questions. Right. Right. And, uh, and we uh, try to uh, discuss all that, but uh, in the, on this show, but we, I mean, who knows if we'll, we'll ever know. Um, I, I have an open mind, but uh, I have no idea if, uh, if they are from here or another dimension or another time right. or another planet. It's just, uh, it's. We need more data. We need yeah. more evidence. We need more people with cameras pointing them to the skies we need yeah. more satellites working towards this sort of thing. The, the funds aren't dedicated. No one's dedicating funds to this science. Um, with the exception of guys like Bigelow, obviously. And, yeah. um, you know, there's other people out there, but it's just, it's not. The, you saw what happened with TTSA. That was, those were people that were like marketing UFOs, let's say. Um, but for, I think, the right cause, because they were trying to put it out in the public eye, like, why not put a Chester Cheetah on UFOs if it gets it accepted a little bit more? Do you know yeah, what I it mean? Was, yeah, it was a little bit, it was a little bit, um, a little bit tough to, they, they were not very approachable, TTSA. They, they um, I know Tom DeLong. Um, of course, he wouldn't be approachable anyway because he's a celebrity. But right. still, 
um, the rest of the group, it was really hard to, and it's kind of like, in a way it was good because they had to keep apart from the UFO community as well because of the fringe element of the UFO community that there is that fringe element that they didn't want to be associated with. Um, so people would take them more seriously. And I do get that. I do understand that aspect of it, but it would be, if there was more transparency in general with them, it would have been better for everyone, I think. Yeah, it felt like their hand was out, but nothing get nothing back. Because uh, I visited and considered contributing uh, to their website. You would have um, lost all your money. <laughs> well, relevant. I don't, I don't donate with the expectation of return. Yeah. However, um, I do like information. And, you know, I know for a fact that they had um, access to meta materials. Well, let's get some, let's hear. What, what's the real result? If it's nothing, I'm fine with that. If it's something, let's talk more about it. I know there was some info, but it's still very, very minor, very, nothing very detailed. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure about that, all that stuff either. Right, um, right. Um, who is doing the science on that? Um, uh, on those meta materials, where were they actually from, and what does it mean um, with what they find out? Does that mean that it's no way it can be reproduced on on this planet, or does that mean that it could be produced, you know, here or naturally or whatever? You know, there's there's a lot of questions there. That, um, but I think the most important part is who it who it is that's actually taking a look at. Well, Martin, um, do you have any questions on my sighting? Because really, that is the big takeaway from me being here today was this sighting. And I, I want your audience to know I am completely open. I will answer any questions you have. Yeah. Um, no, I think um, I think you've you've done uh, pretty well answering my questions. You know, one okay. of the things um, I can tell is that it means a lot to you. Yeah, can, and it really, there was a lot to it that I'm not quite covering the way it happened because it, there was a lot of information being internalized at that time. Um, and what? And the, I guess one of the questions I do have is, um, and we only have a couple of minutes here, and that is, um, you know, I take a look at you know you, because I can picture my brother-in-law who's very logical and. He's got his PhD in chemistry. He worked at Los Alamos Labs, all that stuff. Um, I can picture him seeing this and how he would react because it would be very logical and very, well, you know, this, that. So I guess I'm really interested, and we just have like a minute here, or less than a minute actually now. But I think your how your father reacted kind of is is curious. Yeah, and that that was my big takeaway too is when he was convinced – that's when I became convinced because he had no explanation for what he'd seen. Um, wow. He definitely thought it was something secret. Yeah. He thought it was something advanced and he thought I should keep it close to my chest. In fact, even destroy the photos. Wow. Interesting. Um, but um, once we were all so excited about it, I was like, well, why don't I report it? And we were like, yes, let's just report it. And if it comes back, as military, then we'll take care of getting rid of all of this inf evidence that you accidentally photographed. Wow. All yeah. right. Well, we are out of time. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And if at any point you'd like to have me back at a point when I can include my family members and they're willing to come on, I would love that. Yeah. And that will probably be potentially possible. All right. All right. You take care. Thank you thank so much for having me. Have a great right. time. Thanks a lot. Bye. Yeah. All right, everyone. So that is it for the show. And uh, let me try to pronounce our guest next week one more time. It's Nabosa uh, Borkovich. And uh, he had an encounter on a sailboat that is just really amazing. He'll be on next week. And thanks so much, everyone. And uh, we will see you next week. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>